Leaders aren't just the people who get up on a stage and teach the masses. You can lead in your household wherever you are. And God calls us to be spiritual leaders. How are we? Who hates football? Yeah, we don't talk about football here. I'm happy to talk about Dan Houston if you want, but I'm not going to talk about... Yeah, Houston, we do have a problem. All right. Um, any Batman fans here? Well, surely there's more than that. Batman? No? I love Batman. You know, when Batman, for those of you that don't know Batman, which seems like a lot of you or don't like him, I'm going to give you a little education on Batman. So as you know, when Batman's not Batman, he's Bruce Wayne. You all know that? He's Bruce Wayne. Got a, yeah, we've got a photo of him right there. And he is the owner of Wayne Enterprises, right? And he's a very successful multinational um, company owner, that is, that is Bruce Wayne. And he's so successful, he's a billionaire. So of course, he's a billionaire, so he has a butler, right? <laughs> Alfred Pennyworth. Who likes Alfred? A lot more people like Alfred than Batman. <laughs> That's gonna really actually work for me today. That's perfect. <laughs> Alfred is his personal chef, his tailor, his advisor, his doctor, his housekeeper. Who'd like an Alfred at their home? I'd like one. If I rocked up at your place and I find that you have an Alfred there, I'm going to be assuming that you are either very successful or at some point you were very successful. And it was the same in Bible times. If you had servants, it meant that you were really, really successful. It, you were seen as someone that was important. Now, the thing with Alfred is, as a lot of you put your hand up, Alfred is respected as Batman's butler. But in Bible times, servants were not respected. They were right down the bottom of the list. There was no prestige. Uh, you would never be getting honoured for anything. And the only thing you're most likely to get is mistreated if you were a servant in Bible times. And in Matthew 20, Jesus is teaching the disciples a lesson on spiritual leadership. And we're going to read it here, this is our little passage for today. It's Matthew 20, verse 25 to 28, just four verses. And we're going to be focusing on these this morning. I'm going to be focusing from the New Living Translation. You're welcome to look at it with your own translation, either on your phone now or later if you want to unpack it a bit more. But let's just read it. This is NLT. It says, But Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers in this world, Lord it over their people, and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. Last week, Sally started our series on spiritual leadership, um, and she talked about the fact that spiritual leaders are shepherds. And if we want to be spiritual leaders, we need to be people that look after and love others. And if you haven't watched it, um, well, why not? You should, really, we've got no reason. Get on YouTube, look up Port Life Church, it's there. But today, in part two of this series, we're looking at servants. And today's message is this. If we, are not, if, we, if we are not servants, we are not spiritual leaders. If we are not servants, we are not spiritual leaders. In verse 25 it says, But Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers in this world lord it over their people, and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. You know, I personally, I personally knew a ruler in this world 
that lorded power over their people. Now, I have told this story before, I think about 13 years ago, so I apologise for those that have to listen to this again because it's going to be painful. But there's a lot of people that didn't know me 13 years ago and so um, you're in for a treat. Um, But I want you to picture this. I'm in year two. It's hard to picture today, isn't it? I'm in year two. The ruler was my teacher, Mrs. Pinson. Now, the year two class are her people. And I think the year two teachers are usually really sweet and lovely. Is that what your experience is of year two teachers? I thought they're meant to be lovely and sweet. Not Mrs. Pinson. She was, she lorded over us. She was a shocker. I hope, I hope she's good now, but <laughs> I, I wouldn't be surprised if she did her teacher training with the Taliban. I really don't know. I, I mean, you want to hear what I have to say before you make a judgment, but this lady was a tyrant. Now, I always, I always obeyed her in class, which I tell you, I didn't always obey every teacher. I obeyed this lady not because I respected her. I obeyed her because I was scared to death of her. She was, first of all, abusive. You know, I, in year two, she got me and said, look, there was an analogue clock and, and kids probably have no idea what that means anymore, I don't know. It means there's little hands on there, right? <laughs> And she said to me, tell me, what's the time say? And I couldn't do it. I got it wrong. So she got me. She dragged me by the ear, literally, yes, dragged me by the ear into the next room and just screamed at me, went nuts. She was cruel. On the last day of term, I think it was term two, it's Friday afternoon, and we are going to, she's finally decided to be nice. And we're all going to make paper chains. Everyone knows what paper chains are? You used to get little strips of paper and you sticky them together and you make another little piece of paper and another little piece and, and then you hang them up around the room, you know, for a bit of fun. But she said, first of all, you have to blow up a balloon. For 90 minutes, <laughs> I tried to blow up a balloon and I could not do it for 90 minutes. And she showed no mercy, not once. She, was, she said, I'm sorry, if you can't do it, you are not doing the paper chains. I was crying. You have to understand, everyone else has blown up their balloon. Even the little girls that are half my size have blown up their balloons. I could not blow up one balloon, no mercy. You stay there until you can blow that thing up. And she was nasty. You know, when you're in year two, you love story time, right? Is that true? You love story time. You know, when the teacher reads a book to you in class and you all sit around in front of her and you, she, she reads it and you get to see the pictures because of the way she sits and it's lovely, it's beautiful, it's fun. Not for us. <laughs> we dreaded it. Because every week at story time, she would select two of us to sit in front of her, one on each leg, and rub coconut oil into her leg. Her unshaven legs. While she read to everybody else. She was a monster. If you want to know the problems I have in my life and where they came from. (laughs) And yet, she was our leader. And we did what she said out of fear of punishment. And her leadership was based on her status. I'm the master, you are my servants. And we literally were her servants. And even in today, some of these principles still apply. Now, if kids, if this is happening in your class, 
at this school, come and talk to me, or, or, or Dr. Starling. That obviously doesn't happen anymore, shouldn't. But there are many jobs where the leader barks orders and the people obey. I mean, Andy's a firefighter here, and he's the boss. If, if your workers tell you, no, 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 we're not going to go to the fire, we're going to do something else, I reckon, he'll, I reckon that won't happen, hey? That's not going to happen. If you're in the army and a sergeant tells a private to do something, they do it. They do it out of fear of the consequences if they don't. And if your boss tells you to do something, usually you just do it. Except for my staff, they don't listen to me at all. I don't know why. Not looking at any of them in particular, but based on the authority that they have, which is usually higher than ours, we do what they tell us to do out of fear of the consequences. And this is sometimes necessary, like we said, e.g. war on a battlefield. But the question is, what about us at church? Jesus says to the disciples, you know that the rulers in this world lord it over their people and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you, Jesus says, but among you, it will be different. How will it be different? Well, as followers of Jesus, we should first of all want to lead like Jesus. And Jesus didn't lead, read the Gospels, Jesus didn't lead by putting fear into people. He led by serving people. And if the pastors and leaders here were putting demands on people like, you have to be at church five nights a week, you have to be at every meeting, you have to come every Sunday morning, you have to serve every week, you have to volunteer 15 hours of your time every week. And if you don't, we won't ever offer you a leadership position in the church. That would be us trying to lord it over our people. That's an abuse of power. It's not right. It's not the heart of Jesus. Jesus doesn't care about title or position because to him, that is not what leadership is all about. Jesus said, people of this world lord over people and let authority get to their heads. But among you, it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. Jesus is like, if you really want to be a leader, you need to serve others. It's a complete opposite to how the world sees leadership. They see that leaders are there to tell others what to do. Jesus is like, Leaders serve others. And he didn't just say it, he lived it. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others. And furthermore, to give his life as a ransom for many. You know, Jesus could have come to earth and just bossed everyone around. He really could have. I mean, Jesus is the King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords. He's Emmanuel. He is God with us. He is the saviour of mankind. He is the chief corner, cornerstone, the firstborn over all creation, the head of the church, the holy one. He is judge, light of the world, the prince of peace, the word, the alpha and omega, the I am, the Lord of all, the bread of life, the deliverer, the high priest. He is the lamb of God, the rock, the way, the truth and the life. And oh yeah, he is the son of God. He had the resume. He's got the title. He's got the position. He has the ultimate authority to lord over every single one of us. And could he punish people that didn't comply? Absolutely. If he could make a dead person come to life, imagine what he could do to the living. He had so much power. And yet, the Bible says, even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others. And if that wasn't enough, he, he also gave his life as a ransom for many. So Jesus came to serve others and he came to give his life for others. So if Jesus is the example that we are going to follow, leadership is not about our status. Leadership is about our service. What does it mean to serve? Jesus said, I came here not to be served, but to serve others. And this implies two things. Number one, we have to serve somewhere. And number two, we have to serve someone. It requires action on our behalf. 
And it's why serving at church is so good. Because when you serve at church, you are serving others. No matter what we do there, we are helping others. You know, I love what Nick's done with the JDPs. And I've got one down the front here taking photos at the moment of me, which I'm not loving. <laughs> but nevertheless, there are photos being taken, right? And a couple of really cool photos will probably end up at some point on the net. Hopefully not of me, that won't be cool, but there'll be photos that will end up online. And someone will be scrolling through the internet and you never know, on their social media, a photo might pop up that just might have capture their attention and that might lead them to type in and look up what is this church. Next thing you know, they visit this church. Next thing you know, they hear the gospel. Next thing you know, they're saved. And it might have all started with someone going, I'll take photos for you at church. The deacons go out there and they clean the deck. A lot of people won't even notice because when you get there, you sit on it. It'll be a lot cleaner than if they didn't, right? And it's not just so that if you're wearing white, you don't have to do the laundry. It's there so that people feel comfortable, so that people that may come for the first time have a great experience if they choose to sit out there and might come back and who knows what happened one day if they keep coming back and hearing from the Bible. I've got a guy called Jeff. A lot of you won't even know him probably. He comes here every Saturday with his tape measure and he makes sure that every row of chairs is exactly the same distance apart. And you know why he does it? So that we can fit as many people as we can possibly in this building and that everyone that comes, whether they're regular or visitor, have got enough room for it to be a comfortable experience and not be a bad experience, which is pretty tricky given the size of this room. But he faithfully does that and you never know the impact that can have on someone else. And in the same way, we should be serving people outside of the church. It's not just in the church, like serving at home, doing nice things for family members, even beyond the things that are on your chore list that you're meant to tick off. Just doing something that wasn't expected. It might be serving friends. I love the fact that so many people in this church um, are there for people when they're having a bad day. And, and then they don't just give them a, a message or a, a phone call, but they cook them meals and they take it around to them and they, there's so much love in this church. And we should be doing that. And we should be doing that not just, not just for our friends, but for our enemies. That's even more powerful. Maybe there's someone in the church that you don't actually get along with well. Maybe they're not your enemy, but you just don't really have a lot in common or you just don't get along with them, but you know something's happened to them or you know they're having a bad time through whatever reason. Cook them a meal. Send them a message if you've got their number. Serving your neighbour. You know, don't be... I've got a photo of a neighbour. Don't be that neighbour. <laughs> don't do that. That's a dumb idea. That's stupid. <laughs> That's not you being a spiritual leader. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you what that actually is. Serve others in a way that makes them wonder in a good way. Why should we serve others? Well, I'm going to make it really clear. It's because the Bible says we should. In Ephesians 2, 10, it says, in Ephesians 2.10, it is God himself who made us what we are and given us new lives from Christ Jesus. And long ago, he planned that we should spend these lives in helping others. It's what he planned for us, to spend our lives helping others. That's why we serve others. We serve because it's what God planned for us. Which means that when we are serving and helping others, we are outworking spiritual leadership because you're leading by example. And when we are preoccupied with serving and helping ourselves and doing what's best for us, me doing what's best for me, guess what? That is the opposite of spiritual leadership. When I'm doing everything of what's going to work best for me. Now, before all of you run and jump and want to grab a volunteer role somewhere, I want you to note something. God is not looking for volunteers. Yeah. Never thought you'd hear a pastor say that, right? <laughs> it's true, though. God is not looking for volunteers. Volunteers have to be assured that their involvement won't take up too much of their time. 
A volunteer does not feel obliged. I'm volunteering, I don't have to. It's their choice, right? God's not looking for volunteers. God's looking for servants. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your volunteer. No, servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. The Greek word for servant is doulos. And in Bible times, doulos had a simple meaning, slave. Luke 17, verse 7 to 10 says, Suppose one of you has a servant ploughing or looking after the sheep. Will he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit down to eat? You've had a big day. Have a rest, my servant. Won't he rather say, prepare the supper, get yourself ready and wait on me while I eat and drink. After that, you may eat and drink. Will he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? So you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. What's Jesus saying here? He's saying that a servant has no right to expect a reward for what they do. A servant is a slave. If, God is, if we are God's servant, God doesn't owe us anything. God doesn't owe you anything. The fact that Jesus will reward his servants, the Bible says he will do that, has nothing to do with what you and I deserve. It's not based on our volunteer status, how much work we did for the church. The fact that Jesus will reward his servants is entirely because he is a generous, gracious and loving God. That is why he will reward you. And as servants of God, there are two extreme attitudes we've got to avoid. Number one, we can't be, I'm serving God because I have to. Oh, there's nothing worse than that. And the other one is, I'm serving God because I want a reward. Neither are good paths to follow. Don't do either of them. If that is the reason that you are wanting to be part of and get involved in the life of the church, don't do it. You're wasting your time. Your whole reward will be based on whatever anyone congratulates you here for that. So what should our attitude be? It should be like the attitude of King David. Psalm 48, 40 verse 8, it says, I take joy in doing your will, my God, for your instructions are written on my heart. I take joy in doing your will. It should be the attitude of the Apostle Paul. As slaves of Christ, do the will of God with all your heart. We shouldn't be servants Sorry, we should be servants because we're thankful for what Jesus Christ did for us. That is the reason that we should serve. Whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus came to serve. And the scripture makes it really clear not to be served. Jesus did not come to be served and then he willingly died for you and me and he did it with a heart that wanted to obey the will of his father in heaven so what about us how do we lead by serving and it really depends on the individual 22 years ago rick warren wrote a book the purpose-driven life and i'm going to assume that most people here have read the purpose-driven life how many have read that a fair few you know what, if you have not read it, can I encourage you to get a copy of it? You are missing out. The Purpose Driven Life, Rick Warren. In this book, he explains that whilst we are all called to be servants, we're not all called to serve in exactly the same way. And he says it depends on five th things. And I don't want to look at those five today. You can go away and have a look at the book. I just want to quickly look at three of them. Just touch on three. The first way in which we serve, the way in which we serve is firstly impacted by spiritual gifts. And these are gifts given to Christians by the Holy Spirit to, for the purpose of serving others, right? In 1 Peter 4.10 it says, God has given each of you a gift from his variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. We are given spiritual gifts by God to help others. 
Why? Because God wanted us to help each other. That's what God's plan was, that we would spend our lives helping each other. So spiritual leaders use what God has given them to meet others' needs. I'm sure you've heard this before, but an unopened gift is totally pointless, right? God's given you and I a gift. And we have to discover what it is. We have to open it. And then we've got to bless others with it. Otherwise, it's useless. You know, if God has given me a gift of healing, um, and I'll know if he has, because when I pray for people, more often than not, they will get healed. That's when you start to know I've actually got a, a gift of healing. And if I have this gift, and then I don't pray for anyone, so no one ever gets healed, it's a pointless gift. I have to use it to bless others. I've been super impressed with um, a girl here at church. Her name's Delilah. She's not in here this morning, I don't think. Is Delilah here? She's looking after kids, is she? Right. So... Is that Delilah? <laughs> Hello, Delilah. How are you going? <laughs> Would you like to come and have a chat to me? Oh, she does. She's actually... I was, come down, come down. <laughs> oh, you, oh you, you can sit there, Delilah. That's fine. Thank you. <laughs> Delilah's 11 years old. So I found out this morning. I thought you were about 12, but you're 11. Do you know that the Holy Spirit speaks to Delilah and he gives her words to say to people and I have watched her stand around after church and just wait until adults have finished the conversation and then she goes up to the adult and says, do you mind I have a word for you? And she delivers it. And here's the thing, more often, in fact, not just more often than not, the people that I've spoken to later that I've seen this I've just observed from a distance, I've spoken to those people and they've gone, you know what? That word was actually right. Like she actually, that's exactly what I needed to hear. And the reason for that is that the Holy Spirit gave her that gift. And what I'm impressed with is it's so easy for us, for God to give us something and then we go, no, I'm not going to use that. I'm not going to do that. That's too scary. She steps out and she does it. Can I encourage you? Be like Delilah. Back to work. <laughs> oh, right, here we go. If you want to be more proactive in using spiritual gifts, can I encourage you? We have three courses that break out throughout the year on the Holy Spirit, and we actually look at these sort of areas of you operating in spiritual gifts. Get into them next year. And I think there's even one more later this year. But if not, get into those courses next year. Number two, the second thing Rick Warren mentions is you've got to have, it, it is based on heart. And God has given each of us a, a special passion for particular things. And if you're not sure what that is, what are your interests? What are your hopes and dreams? What drives you? What things do you love? that maybe you love them more than others, and others might think you're a bit weird for loving that, but these are the things that you, your heart is drawn to. What, what are the things that you are drawn to? You know, before I was a, a pastor, I was a, a school teacher, right? And I was an economics teacher, and I loved the stock market. And so I made the students in my class, like, I was so passionate about it, I got them to play the stock market game, which was a thing. I don't know if it still exists anymore. I haven't taught for 15 years, but... There was a stock market game where every, every group were given 50,000 pretend dollars and then they had to invest that into the real stock market for about two months, three months. And then you would see at the end of that how much money you made and the top team would win $1,000 or something in real life. But this was across all schools in Australia. You could offer it, right? I loved it. Like I lived and breathed stock market in those days. I just loved it. It's my addictive nature. I really, really loved it. Between South Australia and the Northern Territory, there were 900 teams. 98 of them were from my classes. <laughs> Over 10% of, of a state and a territory were mine. Passion is powerful. Find what you are passionate in. 
do it. <laughs> if you're passionate about barbecues, and I know some people here are, I'm not so passionate. I'm passionate about eating it. I'm not so passionate about doing it. But why not start? Why not go, I'm passionate about barbecues. How can I use this to serve God? I could like do a barbecue ministry where I invite families from church that maybe I don't know and maybe they don't know each other and I bring them over and because you're so good and passionate about barbecuing, it's going to be a great barbecue. They're going to love it and then they're going to meet people. They're going to connect and you never know. You just might be the difference between making someone feel connected to this church or just wandering off. You just never know because you did something you were passionate about and you used it for God's purposes. That's the point. And the third thing that Rick Warren talks about is abilities. That's, these are the natural things that you're born with. And again, they're given to you by God not to impress others, to serve others. God made us all different. We aren't all great at anything. I can't draw for nuts. The only one that's impressed, impressed with my drawings is Rocky. Um, he will grow out of that pretty shortly. My, uh, I struggle to follow a recipe. I just can't. Well, I see what I'm meant to cook and what I cook, it's never the same. It never tastes the same. You know, I, I really struggle with those capture things. Have you seen that where you've got to try and sign into something and it says like, click all the boxes with a bus, right? <laughs> and then I see like, okay, so there's a little bit of a wheel of the bus in that square. Am I meant to click that one? I often fail those three or four times before I get through. I'm really bad at captures. Do you know what I'm talking about? Do you know what a capture is? They have to be the hardest thing in the world. I just, I can't do it. It's just too tricky. And I can't sing well. I wish I could, I'd love to be a good singer. But it makes no sense for me to go and get singing lessons so that I can just prove a little bit. I, mean, I know Kylie could help me, I know she could. But it makes no sense me investing my time into that because even if she, the being the best music teacher I've ever come across and singing, taught me how to sing better, it's still going to be far worse than all these awesome singers up here. So I'm not going to waste my time. Instead, I'm going to work with what God has given me. And I would encourage you to do the same. You know, a person that is great at music is Peter Gillard over here. I don't know if you know this or not. This, this man is a genius when it comes to composing music and working with students with music. It's a natural gifting that I'm sure he had to learn some of the instruments, but he can pick up any instrument and just play it and there's a natural element to what is going on in his life. Is Rosie Saragunas here? I don't know. Is Rosie around? There she is. Rosie Saragunas. I can't... You have a gift of just welcoming people. Yeah. Now, I... I <laughs> People might think, what do you mean by that? Like, she is the most gentle, loving soul, and I thought this must be a bit of a show. So I went to her daughter, and I said, Georgia, is she normally like this? She said, she is exactly like this at home. She is, and so even her daughter, just who's in year 12, and at this age, you know, could be hating on you, but <laughs> she's not. She, she sings her praises. She has this gift and she uses it for the things of God to just love other people. Kylie Balestri, she's probably not in here, I don't know. Is she? She's probably out with kids. She has an amazing ability with working with kids, teaching kids. And there's just this thing that God has given her naturally to be able to do this. Pauline Halford has a mercy gift. Whenever there are people that are going through hard times that, that come into the church, she is not far behind ready to help, if I'm being honest. Nick Johnston, who's today drumming, do you know what he has? He's got a natural speaking gift. I don't. I wish I did. I have to work on it. This guy has actually just naturally got it. He probably doesn't even prepare. Like, he's just... <laughs> You know what? Andy and Tash Allen have an incredible hospitality gift. Incredible hospitality gift. Hundreds of people end up at their house on any given year 
because they open up their house to people, because God has given them this gift of hospitality and they're not sitting on it, they are using it to connect people. Jason Goff has an incredible helps gifting. I don't know if he's here either today. I don't know who's here, who's not. Is he there? Over there, this man. His heart is always to just, what can I do to get in and serve and help? I tell you what, it's a good gifting, my friend. And if we don't have people that are willing to do that in the church, the church falls over. Ian Osgood, he's not here today. I know because he sits in the same seat for the last 25 years. Um, I'm pretty certain he's not here. He has an incredible administration gift. You can have administrators, he has a gifting in it. It's biblical. There are administration gifts. Joe McKenna, sitting up the back there. Enormous pastoral gift. I'm just naming a few. I'm just naming a few. But Joe will go out of her way to find people that are going through hard times and she'll just lavish love and pastoral care into their lives. I'm just naming a few. Verse 25 says, But Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers in this world lord it over their people and officials flaunt their authority. Like Mrs. Pinson. But among you it will be different. I hope she knows God now. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant and whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. For even the Son of Man came not to be served but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. Leadership is not about our status, it is about our service. If we want to be spiritual leaders, we need to be serving others. That's what Jesus did. And he was the ultimate spiritual leader. And he came not to be served, but to serve others. I'd like you to stand. We're going to spend a little bit of time now in worship. Today is really about, it's really, if I, if I really summarise it, it's a, this is an issue of the heart. That's what we're talking about. It's an issue of the heart. And before I finish today, I just we're going to have our time of worship. I'm going to come back at the end of these two songs. Just got a little one last thing I want to say. But let's spend this time with hearts that are grateful for what Jesus has done for us. So I'm going to hand back to Em, and then I'll be back in a few minutes. You know, I started the message today talking about Alfred. And a lot of people in the room said that they really liked him they respected him and we've got to remember he's just meant to be the servant and I think the reason that he's liked he was liked so much because people could see his heart he didn't have to be there he chose to be there at Batman's side he wanted to serve him because he could see all the good he could see how Batman was helping everybody else and I use that illustration today because I think it's a, it's a really good picture of us and God. Like we should want to serve Jesus because of all that Jesus has done for us and what Jesus does for so many other people, for everybody. That that should mean that we, out of a, a grateful heart, we're not forced to, but we want to serve him. And I pray that that's what you take from here today that God is more interested in your heart than your service. He really wants your heart. And when he has your heart, the service will naturally want to come. You will want to serve him when you come to a clear understanding of exactly what he has done for you. And for those of you that may not be fully aware of what that is, he went to a cross and died. He was crucified for your and my sins. And Jesus did that willingly, freely, because he loved us. And he did it to pay the penalty for the price of our sins so that we could spend eternity with him. And when you fully grasp and get to understand what that truly means, you can't help but have a heart that says, what can I do for you, Lord? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you came here not to be served, but to serve others. Such was your selflessness. 
We thank you that you came to give your life as a ransom for many, as your word says. Lord, this morning, may each of us, as we go away, reflect on this. Lord, maybe we've taken it for granted. And we've got a, as a result, we've had a bit of a warped understanding of what being a servant is and what serving you is. But Lord, I pray that we leave here with a crystal clear understanding of that. And that, Lord, we would each have a deeper, greater understanding and, and, and gratefulness for what you've done for us. And Lord, may that cause things to rise up in our heart to the point that we do want to just serve you with everything you've given us, with the spiritual gifts that you give us, with, with the heart, the things you've given us, the things that we're passionate about, as well as the abilities that you've given us, not to impress others, but to serve others. Lord, I pray that we would have the boldness this morning to actually step out and start using those things for you if we're not doing that already. Lord, help us not to just keep them in the box. Help us not to just unwrap the present. Help us to open it and use it to bless all those, not only our church, but in our home, in our neighbourhood, at our workplace, at our school, wherever we go. Lord, may we be vessels for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.